Pardon? How was Applebee's? Were you all at Applebee's? Oh, yeah. Yeah, good meal. Yeah? I mean, good. Good. Yeah. Well, we'll make this um, quick. I'll, uh, I have a lot of material to edit in, but um, let's just start with, uh, just tell me your, hold on one sec, let me close this door. I put the bag over there, really. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okie dokie. Um, let's see. Uh, so yeah, uh, Larry, just start with your name and uh, your your credentials, so they know uh, oh. what we're dealing with here. All right. Well, actually, my name is Daryl D A R A L D. Here, but I go by Larry. And that's a long story we won't even cover. But at any rate, uh, I've been involved in investigation for 11 years in the Air Force with special intelligence. And then in 1980, I was vice president and loan officer at a bank. And actually, it was 77, I uncovered a uh, a scheme by a special loan officer and ended up working with the FBI and the corporate counsel for the bank. He's now a magistrate in Minneapolis, Art Boylan. But after uh, I left oh, the bank... Real, real quick, Larry, let me get you to um, uh, just tilt the camera up a little more so it's, it's kind of cut, cutting off your head. Well... That's probably good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how's that? That's better. Okay. So yeah, um, so so you have been so just a real quick bite. You you have been a private investigator or you're an investigator for how many years? Well, I started. To, I was chief investigator for a law firm in Wilmer from 1980 to 1987. Then uh, I went and got licensed, and I've been a private investigator since July of 87. And during that period, I was a contractual employee of the State Public Defender's Office, and we covered the 8th Judicial District, which is comprised of 13 counties. And that's how a lot of this stuff evolved from it. I had one client by the name of Dwayne Hart, who was arrested and incarcerated in Wilmer, and the court appointed a public defender for him, John Holbrook, and he employed me as Hart's investigator. Now, I'm limited on things I can discuss about Hart. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. I'm already public. Anything that's already out there, I can talk about. How did you get involved with the, the Wetterling case, and how long have you been involved? <laughs> okay. I got involved in the Wetterling case through Dwayne Hart, working on his case. He was arrested by the FBI and denoted as a person of interest in the abduction of Wetterling. And I interviewed Duane over a period of about 60 hours, actually a little more than 60 hours. And during that period of in interviewing Duane, he supplied me with names of individuals that he thought could be involved in the Waterloo case, Daniel Heinrich being one of them. And so as such, after Dwayne pled guilty, to, I believe it was eight counts of child molestation, he was sent to Lionel Lakes to serve his time, and he was subsequently released and now is under civil commitment for a predatory sex offender, or offender. But uh, after mm -hmm. this period of about five years, 
I was contacted by Diane Milbauer and Robin Branch. They knew I had worked on the water guard on Dwayne Hart's case, which was associated with the waterling situation. And they asked if I would be agreeable to meet with them, and along with Patty Weatherling up in St. Joseph, Minnesota, where Jacob was abducted from. And that's how I became involved in it. They had an individual by the name of Lou Coles, who had a, he was a homosexual, and he was residing with his boyfriend, Dennis Shiles, and that is in the same area where the Wetterlings live. And Coles believed that Shiles may be involved in Jacob's disappearance. So I subsequently met with them and heard what Coles alleged was his evidence or his beliefs and I wasn't, while I was familiar with the case, I didn't have any inroads into what actual evidentiary data and or items that they had. And so I requested from Patty Weathering after listening to him that I knew two investigators, both retired, one from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension which was Dennis Singfuth, and the other one was the chief of Stearns County Detectives, Lou Leland. Now, Lou resigned in a week and a half or two weeks after Jacob's disappearance. He'd been out on an elk hunting trip out west, and Sheriff Graff had the authorities out there get a hold of him and tell him an airplane was coming out to pick him up. And subsequently, he was picked up, flown back here to St. Cloud. And being chief of detectives, he reverted to about third ring on the pecking order. First was the FBI, then the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehensions, then the Sheriff's Department. And they, again, they took Lou and this is probably one of the best profilers I'd ever worked with or met. And they ended up putting him in the basement, preparing what they called AB lists of possible suspects, probables and possibles. And Lou took that for several days and then went up and resigned from the sheriff's department. That trip cost him $4,200. It was non-reimbursable. The county wasn't going to pay him for it. And then they needed him back here so bad they put him in the basement. You know, and that torqued him. And Lou subsequently came to work for my firm for three, three and a half years. And then he moved to Deming, New Mexico. And Dennis Sigafus, who was a retired BCA agent, had initially worked on the Wettering case prior to his retirement. And I offered up both those individuals to Patty Wetterling that I would like to get them to come up and they had inside information in the case and knowledge of evidentiary things that could either dis support or dissuade what Coles was telling us. And at that time, Patty asked that I not contact anyone until she got approval from the Sheriff's Department for them one or both to come in because she didn't want the reputation of the foundation tarnished in any way or frowned upon by the sheriff's department. But now, what, what, do you, what do you make of that, putting the foundation 
in front of uh, actually finding her son. Hold on, let me get some water here. Well, it, I wrote in a memo to the file that I found that to be extremely, how should I say it, disturbing. And by that I mean, to me, if my son was missing, there were two individuals that had knowledge of the case that could come up and either verify or shun the evidence that Coles was putting out about child. I, if my son missing, there's no way in hell that I would have contacted anyone. If they were willing to come up, I'd say, get them up here. However, uh, it was not quite a week later that Patty, after talking with the Sheriff's Department, she had me contact Bennett Sigafoos, and he agreed to fly up and meet with us and go over the information that we had to put any emphasis or validity on any of the things excuse me, that Coles was conveying to us about Childs. Dennis came up and we worked in the case oh, for about three and a half weeks. And this was all pro bono. There was no money involved. The only money that transpired was absorbed by Northwest Airlines and flying Sigafoos up here. But at any rate, uh, we weren't able to put any credibility to what Coles was telling us. And we reached the conclusion that he was trying to use this case as a means to get his lover back. His lover tied in with a couple other guys, uh, Richard Ronstead and Les Carsgrove. They were out of the Minneapolis area, and Childs was at that time living with Cosgrove and Ronstead over in Milltown, Wisconsin. And during our investigation, we subsequently found that there was a child pornography ring involved and Childs and Coles were both a part of it. And so we went and took all our reports and all our evidence down to the Stearns County Sheriff's Department. And the minute we entered the Sheriff's office down there, it was made very blunt and clear to us that they didn't want to hear one word out of my effing mouth as to who might have done this or who did it. And what we were doing was just furnishing them with what we had, had accomplished. And that was it. We weren't down there to tell them anybody's name, but we did include and Sigafoos conveyed to Sheriff Graff that, uh, or no, excuse me, at that yeah. time it was Castriva. Sheriff Castriva, as Graff had retired, about the child pornography. And after he was grossly mistreated, totally unprofessionally by the Sheriff's Department, and I, in turn, was told with expletives what I could do with the information. Uh, Sigafoos then contacted Assistant County Attorney Mary Yonkers and conveyed to her that we had a large volume of reports and we would like her to, if she wanted to have them. And she told Sigafoos, yes, have Parrot bring him over, which I did the following day. And upon entering her office, I got the same treatment that I got from the sheriff's office that they didn't want, or she didn't want any of her investigators trashed 
and she used other verbiage of, as to what I could do with the reports, etc. Now, but what, as an investigator, what do you make of law enforcement? Um, you know, the, well, first off, they, it, it, they, they made it sound like they were tracking down every lead, and then you have someone like yourself and Diane coming in with information. What do you, what do you make of that? Ego. Mm -hmm. Strictly ego. The, the subsequent individuals that we brought forward other than Coles to them, uh, neither one of them, uh, well, let me put it this way. One was two fries short of a happy meal and the other was about a half dozen fries short. And they didn't want to even begin to think that these guys could put it over their learned minds for all these years. You know, they were dummies according to them. Do you believe that there has been um, a strategic cover-up of uh, or protection of uh, the individuals that might be involved? Yes, it, to put it bluntly, because they had preconceived ideas who was involved, one of them being Mr. Razier or Razier, or Razier, excuse me. And that's what a detective Charlie Olson inferred to me when we brought our first reports in on Shile, that he knew who did it and they were going to get him and there was no car involved. Well, that only leaves one person. And that's where Razier lived, you know, in the grove. He went through that grove on their driveway to their home. And again, I am not here to complain or dissuade or defame anybody. What I'm trying to do is say, look at the evidence. And I can go into a litany on that as an investigator. I've been involved in investigating 53 homicides over the years and I would never approach a case the way these individuals had approached it. Up until a month ago, I had never been talked to. I'd been talked at by law enforcement, but never to. And that was when FBI agent Chris Boulder stopped by my office and why? You know, we had evidence, we had statements, we had tapes, we had written communications from prisoners that had been involved with Richard Boehner, who he told while they're in prison, could be prison bravado, I don't know, but they would never get him on the Wetterling case, you know. And it escapes me totally, wholly, and completely why no one ever talked to me. Well, one deputy did, and that was Dan New. He's retired now. But I'm, I believe it was July 27th or 22nd, 1997. You've heard it as the infamous confession tape. Was July 7th. Or July 7th, excuse me. I don't have any of my notes here, so. But uh, I had received a call from Diane. I had talked with Michael before. I had interviewed him. I felt he had credible knowledge and evidence and was carrying a heavy guilt burden over this situation. And uh, I'd also talked to Richard Boehner, his brother, and to Brenda Boehner, which was their sister. Now, Brenda lived just about seven minutes from the abduction site in Wade Park, at the, I believe it's Sunrise Apartments. Sundial Apartments. Or Sundial Apartments. And she alleged that Richard and Michael brought Jacob there 
and had him in a sleeping bag yeah. because he was scared of his father and this type of thing. And her ex-husband, which I ultimately found out, was also a child pornographer. And he was living at that time up in Duluth. And social services had taken the kids away from her as an unfit mother. And I never did, or she never did explain how they found her to be unfit. But she gave us information relative to where Jacob was taken that night. She also alluded to the fact that when the sheriff's or FBI or some investigator came to ask her about Richard, she told him a lie. She said, well, he was down in my grandmother's in Painesville, and they never came back yeah. to follow up on that. She lied because she was scared. Yeah, and again, why weren't they followed up on? You prepare the A, B list. This guy is a sexual predator that had forcefully committed sodomy, both oral and anal, on a seven-year-old boy. Well, they were living in Clearwater, and the boy was from Buffalo, down Wright County. He was also convicted of molesting his brother, Michael. And the family history is the dad was imprisoned for incestual conduct. The older brother, Alan, for the same thing. Richard on the child, or the seven-year-old, and on his brother, Michael. And Michael was state's evidence, turned state's evidence to put Richard away. Now, again, when Detective Noner, all this stuff was brought to his attention, he said he didn't find Michael credible. You could find him credible enough to send a guy to prison, but with this information, he's not credible. <laughs> Sheriff Kostriva's nephew wrote to Diane Muhlenbauer to advise her that he was in prison with Richard Boehner and, me. Yeah, and also called her and told her about Richard's bravado in prison. And I believe my memory served me again. I don't have my notes, ma'am, I'm sorry. But there were three individuals that supported what Richard was saying to them in prison. But ultimately, all this stuff was discarded or ignored or put under the rug or lost. We don't know. But on this one occasion of July 7, when I received a call from Diane that Michael and his sister Brenda were going to come to her house and discuss the case, then she asked if I could come up and clandestinely record or covertly record them. I had a problem. We were doing a case for Meeker County on a, a strip bar in Cedar Mills, Minnesota. And I don't know what happened, but we fried my re transmitting and recording devices, and I had sent them to California. So I had nothing that I could use that would be viable and could cover a period of who knows how long. So I then contacted the Candyoi County Sheriff's Office and talked to a deputy, um, Newman, Todd Newman, who was with the C6 Drug Task Force, and explained to him the situation, and I asked if I could borrow their equipment. 
he in turn then got a hold of his commander, the drug force commander, and told him what was going on and asked if he could loan the equipment to me. And that individual that was task force commander was Joe Pohl. And Joe advised him that it was their equipment. He didn't want outsiders using it, but yet he knew it had to be there while it was in use so that nothing would happen to it. And he and I were upstairs in Diane and Joe's bedroom, and he, their equipment consists of a pager device that was their transmitter. And again, wirelessly, we recorded the conversation upstairs. And as such, Michael made admissions that Detective, or well, at that time, Agent Newman, in his words, presumed it to be a confession tape and that it should be gotten as quickly as possible to an experienced investigator, interrogator with the Stearns County Sheriff's Department. But prior to meeting with Diane at her house, I arranged with her that I could talk with Michael and have Newman with me by reporting him to them. And she could tell him prior to our arrival that I was up there working on a workers comp insurance case. And we've been surveilling some people in St. Cloud and I would have one of my investigators with. Well, I had the only recording device I had with me was a small cassette recorder. It, we met them at Perkins. They'd been there about 15 minutes before we got there. And Michael and Brenda both knew me. They were completely at ease with me. They didn't know Newman, but presumed he was what we told him he was, just investigating a workers' comp case. And I started talking to Michael about the case itself, uh, the Wetterly case. And Michael again described what had happened at that location, who was there, etc. He described the gun as a silver handgun with black grips. He also talked about a knife being used. And to my knowledge, there was never anything in the press or released to the public about the color of the gun. But he described it as a silver revolver with black grips. And after talking with him, and he demonstrated both Newman and I and Diane how he alleged that Lou Coles had grabbed Jacob and how he controlled him and got into the car. Now, what's really funny, if we go to the night of that kidnapping, Jacob Wetterling, Trevor, and Aaron, his buddy, Trevor being his younger brother, called, got permission ostensibly from Jerry Wetterling. Patty denied him to go up to the store, but Jerry agreed because Jacob had been feeling kind of remorseful about a hockey game or basketball game or whatever he was involved with that day and not playing well, and he thought a movie would cheer them up. Now I'm re reiterating what was put into the papers as to why yeah. he agreed to let them go. But anyway, they get up and take off two bicycles and a scooter, okay? The youngest was on the scooter. Now, Heinrich, alleges in his 
confession to the judge that he's on a dead end gravel road. Question, how the hell do you know it's a dead end gravel road? And what pedophile goes out at nine o'clock at night on a dead end gravel road to abduct kids? Okay. But he but he goes and says he passes them on the road. There one was wearing reflective vests, they had flashlights, and they were all on bicycle. They weren't. Even Heinrich, not being, you know, a high IQ type individual, should know the difference between a bicycle and a scooter. Okay. But then he says he pulls up in this driveway and turns around and faces the direction they were going. And he waits 20, 25 minutes for them to come back. And then he accosts him, he gets out, puts on a mask, takes his gun, goes down, and hits the kid. What Heinrich's modus operandi, so to speak, in previous cases was he would take them the minute he saw them. How did he know they were coming back, that they lived down there? They could have been visiting, going back into St. Joseph. Right? The other thing that really bothers me with it is in his confession, he says that after he takes Jacob, handcuffs him, places him in the front seat of the car and has him bend down, he goes out the gravel dead end road to Highway 75, which is a county road. And he turns left on that, okay? All the while he's doing this, he's listening on the scanner, and there's all this talk about this abduction. There wasn't, okay? But the primary thing is that when the Trevor and Aaron got back to Jacob's house, the babysitter had after they told her, she called her dad. Her dad came over, questioned the boys, called the Wetterlings, and then called the sheriff's department. So you have a 15, 20 minute lapse in time there. But the judge bought what he was saying. But anyway, he said he went up towards Albany and then cut back, came out at Roseau on the Highway 23, and then went down to Painesville. Again, the Boehner brothers, grandmother lived there, and they previously lived in Painesville. So they would know each other, okay? All these people network and share and this type of thing, okay? But he says that he pulls up into this area by the sewage ponds. And he has Jacob get out of the car and undress. And then they move over towards this grove of trees. And the judge asks him, what did you do to Jacob? Nothing. Nothing? No. We both masturbated. That was it. And then Jacob said, I'm cold. So I tell him, well, put your clothes on. Jacob says, will you take me home? He says, no, there's too many towns between here and there. And then he tells Jacob, uh, turn around, I've got a urinate. Now, give me a break. You two are standing here facing each other, masturbating. And to urinate, he has to turn his back. Jacob turns his back. About that time, a police car goes by on Highway 23, and the, this area wasn't that far off 23. No siren, but it had the lights on, was headed north. And that's when Heinrich said, you know, I got a problem here. I'm going to have to get rid of my witness. Okay? 
Now Heinrich had the scene and put on a mask. Other cases like Jer, the kid from Cold Springs that he abducted, molested, and then just kept his pants and underwear. He let him go after he put his snowmobile suit on, right? He just tell him, get out of the car and go home. Wasn't wearing a mask. Now, why would you wear a mask if you're 35 miles from home? You're in an area nobody knows you. Okay? Right. But he says, he, now he's fearful that the squad car is going by. He doesn't want to be seen or heard doing anything. But then he takes his handgun, loads two rounds in it, and then Jacob still got his back to him, walks up, points at the back of Jacob's head, pulls the trigger, click. Well, number one, the, Jacob would hear the cylinder being shot. Probably metallic sound of putting two rounds in it. Then he hears a click. What would you do as an 11 year old? Would you stand there and not look back? Or would you take off like hell bent for leather? But then click, not, so then he shoots. And he said, Jacob's still standing. And he's but three feet behind him. And Jacob's still standing. So he shoots him again and he goes down. Well, then he says he drags him about 100 yards, throws some brush and grass on him to hide him and drives back to his apartment, leaving the body later, okay? Then what's really wild is he walks back a couple hours later with a trenching tool for a small shovel and says, ah, this isn't gonna work, but there's a bobcat over at this construction site or a gill front end loader, I don't know which. But he tells the judge, I know where they keep the key. Neither the prosecutor or the judge said, how do you know that? But then he gets in and starts it up. Now this guy doesn't want to be seen. Turns on the headlights and drive. I don't know, maybe a quarter of a mile. And he's got the headlights on while he's burying this kid with a front end loader. He gets all done. He's going to return the front end loader. And he realizes Jacob's shoes are still lying on the ground there. So he picks them up, takes, goes down the road about 100 yards. He throws them into a ravine. Okay. And then he parks the bobcat net where he found it. Apparently never said anything about the keys, but apparently returned the key. Now you got a guy shooting off a gun in the edge of town at 10 o'clock or so at night. You got him stealing a bobcat, driving it, you know, with the headlights on, but you don't want to be seen. You don't want any attention brought to you. So he gets there. And after he gets back to his apartment, he just goes to sleep. He doesn't take anything, all his previous thing. He's either with a knife cut off some hair. And again, that goes back to what Michael Boehner said. There was a knife and a gun. But he cuts off a lock of this kid's hair, takes another one's pants and underwear, takes another one's stocking cap. They always want a souvenir that they can ultimately masturbate over when things aren't too active for them. Okay. So he goes through all that, but he doesn't take a thing of Jacob's with him. You know, it doesn't make sense. All right. But then a year later, 
He doesn't drive back to the sea. He walks back to the sea again with a small shovel and a garbage bag. Nope. We're running out of battery power here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah. Hold on a minute. Okay. Yeah. Julie's there. Perfect. Okay. But a year after he commits his alleged dastardly, I should say, allegedly commits this dastardly deed, he goes back to the abduction site with a trenching tool and a garbage bag. Okay? He says when he arrives, he sees that there's a part of the red jacket and some bones and a skull. And he takes them. He doesn't dig into the grave, but he picks them up. They've been unearthed somehow. And he puts the jacket in, and then on top of that, he puts the skull and the other small bones. And then he takes them and walks across the highway and reburies them about two feet deep but never goes back for 26 more years to check on either grave site. Now, when they unearthed the first one, they found nothing but animal bones and teeth. What happened to the rest of them? Okay. Then they go back to prison and they bring him out again and say, we can find nothing here. We're not going to be able to consummate a deal here unless we find evidence of Jacob. So he says, well, I know where I reburied stuff. Didn't know about that first time. And I'll show you where I did that. So then they bring him back to the scene. Then he goes over, shows him in the farmer's field across the highway where he buried the skull, the jacket, and the bones. And he alleges he dug it about two feet deep. Now, with the front end loader, it was a hell of a lot deeper than that, wouldn't you think? But they surfaced. Why did they surface? Because they weren't there in the first place. These are the souvenirs. You know, and that he took from their little gala get together with this group of other cronies, and especially who they are, I can only surmise the Boehner brothers were part of it and Coles was part of it. Coles were the rest areas and all that stuff on I 94 from Eau Claire, Wisconsin to northern or western Minnesota, and also north and south, same thing, on Highway 23. But, yeah, I don't know how the prosecutors were talked into doing this deal with him. They had him on 25 or 26 counts of manufacture, possession, and distribution of child pornography. Each one carries 20 years. Now, they could have concurrently sentenced him, not giving up to one of them, or they could have tacked him on consecutively, and that's what I'm sure they threatened to do. Now, Heinrich isn't smart enough to say to his attorneys, hey, I know where this kid's buried, and that they don't prosecute me or bring charges for murder, and they drop all but one of these other, you know, I'll take you to it. It's so literal, he got away with murder. If what he alleged in his confession is fact, but nobody questioned his facts. If they had questioned his facts, they wouldn't have been able to come up with a body. Okay? Because no judge 
is, you know, where's the skull? Where are the rest of the remnants of his body? Well, didn't they also say the main thing is that they identified him with by the teeth? And in nowhere does it say that there was a skull to hold the teeth, or right? So talk talk about that. Well, here's the thing. He identifies as complete skull. The skull is some small bone. Nothing about jawbone or teeth or anything like that. Now, when they, again, until they release all this supposed evidence that they have, you know, we have to kind of quasi speculate as to what was at that site. But we do know, based upon the results of the first search, and it's in the search warrant, and that's another thing. The search warrants, both one and two, contain the same address. Okay? Number two was across the highway, wasn't it? at that location. Nobody questioned that. Okay. But here he says, here's all the, or the stuff that we found. And forensic showed it to be animal bones and animal teeth. Nothing else. In the second search warrant, in the one where he had reburied the body, None of that was there. Nothing about teeth, nothing about the skull, none of that. They just said some bone. Okay? Apparently. And, the, and then the jacket and the t-shirt that had his name on it and the number 11. Yeah, there was no jacket there. Yeah. Yeah, well, there were remnants of a red jacket, oh, wow. but it, not enough that they could identify it. But doesn't any of this strike a even-minded thinking individual that something ain't right here? <laughs> you know, who is he covering up for, and why would he cover up? Well, number one, he got 17, he'll serve 17 or 20 years. If somebody in prison doesn't kill him first, because they basically don't like pedophile child molesters. But he was told, you may be civilly committed after that as a predatory offender. Well, it's already being questioned by a federal judge here in Minnesota about the legality of holding someone for life over something you think he might do. You're only guilty of a crime if you do it. I can think about assassinating the whatever, but if I don't attempt to do it, I haven't committed a crime. And in this case, he's looking at, okay, I'm 53, I'll be 70 when I get out. Still viable sexual operating individual. You know, unless they give him something to shrink up his gonads in prison. But I doubt seriously they do that. I mean, that's artificial castration, and that's already been deemed as a no no. But the thing is, all these people network, and they're far, far more prominent people involved in this than people want to admit to or even speculate about. Now, somebody works a deal like he got, you know, I mean, this guy dropped out of the 10th grade and ultimately went back and got a GED. You know, but he, he's not a brain trust. He wouldn't have any idea how to think this through to work these deals. Somebody took the deal to it. Keep your mouth shut, and this will be all said and done. The parents are satisfied. To them, they've recovered their child. There's closure there. 
Yeah, I could literally go on and on for hours on this stuff. But none of it was adequately investigated. And I had an FBI agent, Chris Volkers, come sit in my office. The first, as I said, other than Dan knew, he came down to collect the tape and a transcript of that confession tape that I'd taken up at Perkins Restaurant. The sheriff wanted that immediately. Secondly, the sheriff demanded from the Candy O'Hai County Sheriff that he make Newman write a letter of apology. Now, why should you write a letter of apology? Try to assist a sister agency in solving a kidnap. Does it make sense? What? You know. Well, la lastly, um, and then I'll, then I'll let you go because I definitely got enough. But like, so, <clears throat> what do you think happened, and why do you why do you continue to work this case all after someone has confessed? Because I don't believe the confession. It doesn't ring true. He either committed perjury to the court, or he's covering for somebody. And I don't believe he committed perjury. He's covering for somebody, other individuals that were associated. As Mr. Hart gave me a list of 26, I believe it was, names of individuals he knew to be pedophile in the Belgrade, Painesville, Cold Spring, Richmond, St. Cloud area. And I'll, how do you know this unless you're all sharing data, information, and victims? And do I believe that there's a sharing going on up here with people of prominence? Yeah, hell yes, I do. And I, again, I don't want it to sound like I know more than law enforcement. I'm just talking to you about basics and what should be done. If somebody came to me with the information that Diane Millenbauer furnished to them, I would be tickled pink. You know, it's like the people that don't believe in psychics. There are some psychics that are charlatans or other ones that have a gift. It's been demonstrated and proven. No way they could know about things unless they were visualizing, you know, something was prodding it. And Diane's not a psyche. She's just a concerned citizen that has busted her bugs to try to get them to look at something. And they've chosen not to. They allegedly, like I say, Coles took a PSE and failed it miserably. And the examiner conveyed that to them, that he failed both on the lettering and his granddaughter's situation. Detective Noner tells us that he gave a polygraph to Richard Boehner while he was in prison, and it cleared him. Bullshit, pardon the French. Diane checked, he gave Diane the name of the individual he said did the polygraphing, who was with the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. That person was contacted. He had never polygraphed Richard Boehner. Secondly, he didn't even know who Detective Dave Noner was. You know? And, it, and tell me something about that, you know, there's just no way that all these different people on all these different recordings can be coming up making these stories up why a why would you do it and b there's just you know no way to put that together so there's something here and you know and you want to tell the story kind of thing precisely and i say it goes back to like michael bader describe the gun describe the way jacob was uh restrained okay talked about, this is back in 97, talked about the drag racing that occurred at that location 
We have an employee from the foundation in the second draft, apparently he was writing a book, James Pearson, and he in turn stated there was a rumor of drag racing in that area that night, and it was confirmed. Now, how the hell would Michael Boehner know that? It was never conveyed out to the public. Lou Gold burned his car, according to his wife and the Boehner boy. Yeah. Okay, and to hide the evidence. Okay, he burned on his son Michael's fireplace or location over in Wisconsin. In late 1989, Lou Coles came into a ridiculous amount of money. He had offered Miss Blue Darn 30, I think 25 or $30,000 for a six month old baby to be used for sexual gratification. They could sell it, okay. And nobody's talked to Miss Blue Door. Nobody's talked to Marshall or Marsha Coles. And there's a wealth of information there that supports what we've been conveying to you. How did Brenda Boehner on July 7, 1997, know about Milltown, Wisconsin. Yeah. She had no dealings with them other than that's where allegedly Coles and uh, the Boehner boys took it. And she said, you'll find his coat over in Milltown. Well, I never found his coat, apparently, not identifiably find it in the grave, you know, at Painesville. And why would you, in no other cases, did Heinrich ever take his victim to Painesville? Now, the willing victim, the kids that they plied with marijuana and beer and boob, yeah, them, and then they would all share them. in your head to control yourself. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, this is the only thing I can think of, as I told you before, in all my involvement in this, the only law enforcement officer ever come to talk to me was Chris Bowler, or Bolters. Bolter, and that was to shut me up. He didn't want us talking about any of this anymore. And do I have empathy and sympathy for the weather? Yes. Do I believe there might be some involvement by someone in the family? Who's to say it wouldn't be the first time? You know, and you got Vern Sykes trying to buy the tapes. And sent over here by Jerry Wetterling. He had Jerry Wetterling taking some friends by the Boehner house and saying that's where they think Jacob might have been taken. You know, but uh, like I said, I'm 78 years old. I've been on a lot of rough roads in my life. But this one is the most intriguing road I've ever ridden down. And I've been involved in multiple murders, you know, over all these years, abductions up in northern Minnesota. And nothing compares to this. And nothing. I mean, sloppy law enforcement. Well, again, I don't like to disparage them, but it sure doesn't look professional to me. Uh -uh. You follow up everything. I mean, in intelligence, we take all these little bits and pieces and fit them together to make the picture. 
These guys took all the little bits and pieces and threw them in the garbage. They didn't want a picture. Why? I don't know. Only they can answer that. 